So hello, everyone. I'm going to present a, a short overview of uh, the work that with the International Environment Forum together with the EBBF. And that's a follow up of the conference that was it was presented during the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. We have looked at um, what is the idea of a global system accounting. And this was done with uh, different working groups. And they included the environmental uh, dimension. It included also human well-being and the spiritual dimension. So uh, for the environmental accounting, uh, looking at carbon, biodiversity, and pollution. And for all of them, actually, that included also for human well-being and uh, spiritual uh, count, was to look at the ideal state of where we want to go and uh, understanding the current situation uh, by looking at um, also the current trend, looking at positive and negative trends, and also looking at strategies and solutions in order to move in the right direction. There's a lot of data available for carbon, for biodiversity. We, we know quite well from the scientific information that carbon is part of a cycle, which is uh, quite well regulated in nature. Carbon, since life appeared on Earth, this was one of the amazing invention of life, is to be able to, to use carbon in a form of gas and store it and produce organic material, producing living material from carbon using the energy of the sun. And that's, that's called photosynthesis, uh, which is taking place on land, in the oceans, in rivers, in wetlands. And all of these landscapes are able to store and collect carbon from the atmosphere, but they also release naturally with respiration, which is a part, normal part of life. But since um, humans started to actually use this organic material from the early time of human evolution, but we've accelerated the process. Since the indust industrial revolution, we started to burn fossil fuels, which are part of the carbon cycle. But having more precise indicators really helps us, help us understand better the whole process and to what extent we disturb the process by using the resources, especially all the uh, organic material, but not just for burning, but also for construction uh, and, and also for food, of course, because food is part of that, that cycle. So the ideal state uh, is that carbon would be very well regulated and stabilized. There are a number of drivers that are, that are pushing it in the right or the wrong direction. And positive drivers include uh, our change of using use of energy, we, we need to go into the energy transition where we actually reduce, eventually stop using carbon as a source of energy. So we need renewable source of energy. We need also to respect and protect our natural ecosystem and change our all our industrial activity, including farming, which should be able to, to store carbon, but it's opposite because we use a lot of machines. We actually release a lot of carbon by farming, by producing food, whereas in reality, food is a storage of carbon. And we need also a good global governance because the topic is global by essence. Carbon does not stop at the border. When it goes in the atmosphere, it goes beyond. So this is really a global issue. But the question is, uh, we are increasing our debt. Uh, and it's not just that it's impacting climate, but it's also reducing our resources. So increasing debt, and uh, so how do we actually, we need to reflect on how going in the right direction. We need also maybe carbon sequestration, innovation, new ideas, but also a new way of operating. If we look at um, ecosystems and if we look at biodiversity, there's also a lot of data information available. And here, this, this source is provided by the International panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Ecosystems provide many services that we use for our economy. Many of them are not accounted properly. We know quite well which drivers are uh, affecting negatively ecosystems, reducing their size, the diversity of life. Well, here you can find on the slide, on the right side of the slide, all the declines in nature where ecosystem extent and condition is reduced the capacity of ecosystems to provide their services, the quality, the diversity within the system, but also 
uh, the size and the extent uh, fragmentation of these ecosystems is affecting their life inside. And that's in turn also affecting the services provided. Services include uh, provisioning services, regulating services, provisioning such as food, but also cultural services, which are, for example, what indigenous communities are using these uh, natural ecosystems. So looking at biodiversity, just an example here of what kind of work we've been doing is looking at uh, strategies, looking at, uh, as I mentioned, the ideal state of biodiversity would be that natural ecosystem stay intact and stable on land, uh, in the atmosphere, and in water, in ocean, lake, rivers. These targets are actually exist. I mean, there's international organizations, uh, international agreements go in that direction. There's a goal, the next target would be to uh, protect 30% of land and sea by 2030 in only nine, in only eight years from now, which is ambitious, but very much necessary. The question is, oh, with all these strategies and goals, is our capacity to respond to these goals. So indicators are really important for that in order to be uh, able to implement the ideas. Maintaining biodiversity is not just maintaining the natural capital, it's also increasing our capacity for resilience. And in the case of climate change, we need more resilient, we need communities to be resilient, but we need also the natural system to be which is naturally more resilient when it's strong and when the capital, the natural capital is healthy. But when we disturb it, then the capacity for uh, adapting and for resilience becomes much weaker. And that's the importance of this capital. Looking at the pollution, uh, the principles are very similar and they're all very much interconnected because emissions of uh, gases resulting from burning, uh, fossil fuels and burning uh, organic material results in, uh, of course, greenhouse gas, but also results in uh, air pollution and all kinds of pollu pollution is uh, taking place in the atmosphere, but also in the soil, on land. What are the pollutants? Which one are the most dangerous for human health? Which uh, pollutants are lasting long? Which one can be degraded and so on? There has been a, a recently more effort done in the importance of plastic pollution and microplastics and in the oceans on land, but also in the ocean. And there's a treaty now that is being prepared by the UN uh, because it's not only a local issue, it's become a global issue because uh, plastic waste is also being exported to poor countries because which country don't want to have them, but it's only one planet at the end. And another issue, a global issue is also waste sent in orbit around the planet, which is also becoming an increasingly important topic. So we have all these international environment agreements that are dealing with pollutions, but they're not enough. More indicators are needed. And here, we, here is again, the importance of uh, accounting, of uh, a proper accounting. So in conclusion for now, uh, when it comes to the environment, the current economic system encourages humanity to live recklessly on unlimited credit without any plans to reimburse their debts, as it was the case in the past. We had plenty, we had a lot, we thought it would be infinite, but we're very much aware now that we are on the limited resources. So it's really time to work, uh, not just globally, but also locally on proper accounting for our assets and debts and together devise a plan to balance our accounts following the natural systems. And uh, another point I want to mention, and which is maybe introducing for the following discussion is um, that in order to implement these ideas, a key element is to ensure that our true values are maintained. And then the question will come, what are our true values? Are we talking about? One of them is truthfulness when it comes to accounting uh, if we don't have the right, the true information, how do we know where we are? But also, what is guiding us for the future? What are our true values? So uh, we need an account for our natural environment, and we need also accounting for human well-being, because they're all both 
interconnected. Uh, thank you, Laurent, and uh, very fantastic presentations uh, linked to our today's topic. Um, so I would like to then introduce Gary to take over the stage uh, for sharing his insights on the recent uh, published paper from the Baha'i International Community on the one uh, planet, one habitations. Gary, please. I'm just going to show this on the screen because this is the document that I'll be talking about. There are many different issues in the document. And what I decided to do was to try something a little bit different. Basically took the document, there it is, I think. And, you know, I just looked at it and I started picking out pieces in the document that I would like to talk about. So I think, you know, there's a lot of materials in this document. You can see on, on the top of this document here, picked out issues that I think may be more important. A lot of my work was oriented on the development of this one people in one global homeland. That was the kind of work that I did for many years. And so I'll just read short sentences from the document, make a comment or two. Uh, humanity faces a paradox growing more consequential by the day. You know, the human race has never held so much power. On the other hand, we're giving rise to consequences, not only worldwide, but seem to be potentially irreversible. And this is something uh, that I often discuss with young people and in classes and teaching um, when I indicate that, you know, the coming decades, you know, in the world today, you know, we're, we're dealing with situations that may become catastrophic and irreversible. And certainly, you know, there's a lot of research that's been done on what we call surpassing planetary limits that's in this document. And this can be climate change, it can be biodiversity loss, it can be environmental degradation. These are actually researchers who have been providing this material and, so, and, and using it uh, in various uh, forums and in universities and teaching students and young people. These things are events that we need to be able to continue to understand. So needed action is a matter of conscious choice, as it says in this document, prevention. And, you know, um, it could be prompted by destruction and suffering wrought by the environmental breakdown that we're looking at today in different parts of the world. The interconnection that we have, it's the humanity has with, uh, with the environment, with dependence on the environment and with the world in which we live in. I mean, um, if I just uh, talk a little bit about here in Ukraine, um, the interconnection, um, with the uh, European Union. Um, were we interconnected? Well, actually this internet connection really began to uh, develop, I think about five or six months ago when this war started. And so we see now even the, the European Union is consolidating, you know, at this point in time, it's being interconnected. I think it's something um, that you just don't read these documents in my opinion and say, oh, well, that's wonderful. I read the words are very nice. Actually, I think the best way to deal with these documents is to read them slowly, think about them, meditate about them. And so, you know, um, we really, come, you know, attitudes about the source of our subsistence and this sort of things, wealth and wonders of the earth are common heritage. But how many of us realize that we're living in a world today that, that is beyond the capacity of the world to be able to survive you know, if we continue to increase the materialistic aspects of the world and the way we're living, the food systems around the world. Uh, we know that, for example, something like 30% of the food coming out of Ukraine, well, supposedly coming out of Ukraine, is going into Africa, it's going into the Middle East and off to China. And um, what happens when the war blocks these food from leaving? You know, how is that going to deal? How are we going to be able to deal with some of these sources of our subsistence? And so these things cannot be just uh, discussed at a very broad level, in my opinion. We need to bring them down to what are we doing today in our world and in the communities in which we're living, you know. And finally, of course, you know, um, <laughs> I can remember, uh, say, 50 years ago that if, uh, as a Baha'i, I talked about one world, uh, half the people uh, in, the, in the United States that said that, oh, you know, the United States is not, you know, it's not part of the world, but kind of different from everybody else. Whereas we know now that we actually are living in one global homeland. And in terms of whether it's climate change or whether it's terms of the, um, the, the medical issues that are involved, the war that's going on now, 
um, and and the inequalities that are that are growing in capacity, all of these things are hitting us a part of the world in which we're we're living in, and the part of the world that we're going to have to be able to deal with as we go into the future. And I like this particular quote because it talks about an intergenerational perspective in which the well-being of future inhabitants is taken into account at all levels of decision making. Uh, making. Well, intergenerational, I understand that affecting several generations. Well, when I think of several generations and I look at the world today and I look at my generation, and I look at the young people, I obviously think that the, gener the future generation for young people, you know, that are maybe uh, junior youth and youth and uh, students and going into the university, I think they're going to be living in a different world than the world that I lived in, because we're not going to be able to continue to have excessive GDP growth, for example, excessive uh, population growth, uh, issues re relating to food and other things. So, you know, the young people, they are, are going to be faced with a completely different world. And so I think we need to take an intergenerational approach and particularly give a lot of, let's say, credence to uh, the development that the young people are going to have to be able to deal with in the coming 10 or 20 or 30 years. But I think the main issue that I'm talking about is that we should be reading this document and we should be spending our time looking at the different thoughts that are there because they're all quite relevant and it's not just one thought. Um, of course, the holy writings of high faith, is there any deed in the world that would be nobler than service to the common good? Well, I think, um, I think all of us have some relationship to service to the common good. This is what we want. This is what we work on. This is what we're developing. And this is what we need to see as we go forward. Just when we talk about certain things like the stewardship of the, national world, the natural world offers a powerful means to reconcile, reconcile these interconnected ideals. Again, uh, stewardship, kind of this job of supervising or taking care of something. And, and it's, uh, I put this word in systems thinking because this is the thing that really impresses me. When we look at all of these things, we really can't take one of them and say, okay, we're going to deal with that one. No, actually, we need to be able to look at them from different perspectives, listen to it from different people in consultative groups. We may have all different ideas about how these things are view and how we're going to reconcile them. Uh, and we have to come to some kind of an agreement. And this is what we do, I think, going forward in the world. We need to be able to um, have reconcile interconnected ideals in ways that will lead us to a better result in the coming decades. I think I put this one in because this is my particular, I mean, of all the activities, um, the local communities uh, is the one that I think is most important. And I've been doing this all my life and I don't know how many different countries, but a lot of them because I worked with the development of local communities. Uh, this is what I wanted to do. This is what I thought was important. And of course, where we find ways in which individuals can blend together and to create a community that's sustainable. And when I was in Africa, for example, um, um, it wasn't a matter of um, these Africans in the villages, You know, how do we deal with them? Uh, at that point in time, we, we began to understand that uh, if it's an African village, okay, it can be a small, uh, it can have it be a small village or a small group, but they still need to have certain facilities, for example, educational capabilities and other health capabilities that are needed if we're talking about the future to just say, oh, well, that's just an, a local community and we don't have to deal with it. I don't think that's the case at all. We need to find individuals, blend together and come up with answers in a kind of a consolidated, uh, um, consultative kind of a way. Here's one that I really um, don't like at all, um, you know, an agreed upon international advisory body, for example, that could assess such, such impacts across national borders and recommended adjustments or restitution as necessary. Um, I think all of us um, understand about the war in Ukraine. We, we know that, you know, of course, Ukraine was never uh, going to be part of the EU. I mean, even a year ago, I think there was hardly no possibility for even uh, being accepted in the possibility of being part of the EU. The EU has grown to 28 countries. But, you know, essentially, you know, we, an international body, you know, actually is, is beginning to develop within the EU. Uh, as a kind of advisory body where the different countries are beginning to provide support to Ukraine. And Ukraine, actually, in terms of food development and is beginning to also 
uh, have a, a, an international perspective in terms of the, the amount of food that we can produce and, and supply to different countries around the world, including Africa, the Middle East, uh, and other countries. And so, um, but if we talk something like the United Nations, and here we have Russia in the Central Council of the United Nations, we know that the United Nations has some problems, and I think even the EU needs to be able to improve the international advisory bodies that are going to be, be able to help us as we go forward you know, in the future uh, uh, decades. But basically, I think you know, um, my goal would be that everyone is a document that should be read, and it should be read um, and meditated upon and considered and thought about. Here, just to finish up on climate change, you know, no longer can the peoples of the world be asked to tolerate the disjunction the dis of agreements signed but left in, unimplemented. The, when I saw that particular quote, I said, hmm, what about climate change? Are they, how these agreements, are they signed? Are they being unimplemented? If you ask me today, they are being. If you look at what's happening in terms of the amount of oil and gas that, that Russia is, being, is using uh, in the war and in, in, in the EU, European Union and elsewhere, we know that this is going to develop you know, huge issues in terms of climate change and other things. So this is the kind of world that we're living in and we have to be able to view the realities of this world and then I think to be able to look for ways in which we can see them you know, develop into the future. Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, so uh, the next speaker is Arthur, and Arthur has been very active also in connecting GSA with uh, and, and Stockholm Plus 50 event. And also we have been received quite a lot of positive response from the um, like-minded organizations, as well as the people uh, who joined today. And so we would like to see uh, what could be the, the interconnection uh, between um, BIC uh, paper as well as the uh, GSA accounts in terms of the process. So Arthur, please. Trying to bring together two complementary processes is, is quite an interesting challenge because the global systems accounting we've been working on you know, before the statement came out, but we'd also been collaborating in the development of the, the BIC statement. And so you know, it is really trying to say, how do we develop the tools to put the Baha'i principles you know, in relation to the challenges we're facing? Pollution biodiversity, but looking at the human side, relating poverty, you know, meeting people's health needs, providing food, providing work, you know, according to the Kitab Yaktas, the, the law of work, managing the, the knowledge and science and all the, the elements, the in, intent and of a culture and the spiritual dimension. So they're really sort of taking, how do we take key Baha'i principles and apply them? This is what well-being really means, not using financial accounts, because the financial accounts we have now, GDP, they're all about money. Everything is converted into money. And therefore, and that's what feeds greed and accumulation of wealth. Let's find another way of looking at things that are closer to the Baha'i teachings that also respond to the call to replace GDP. So when we look at the, at the uh, by community statement that, that, that Gary has just presented, we can see that it, it calls for similar fundamental questioning of assumptions focusing on a relationship with nature. So it puts more the environmental dimension of the accounting process. But it also you know, is looking at the processes and is most relevant to the processes that we're trying to use with the accounting system in order to respond to the kinds of needs identified in the statement. There's not a lot of direct overlap because they're, they're quite complementary. But the statement does call for measuring well-being in new ways. And it has a lot to say about spiritual capital, which is one of the dimensions we're looking at in the accounting. But it also talks about the processes to transform society with a systems perspective at multiple levels, which is also one of the aims of the accounting project. The natural world in all its wonder and majesty offers profound insight to the essence of interdependence. So this is one of the major themes at the very beginning of the statement is this interdependence and how Everything is part of an interconnected whole. Then it talks about how we're so reliant on, on this Earth system that we face this paradox where, on the one hand, we can shape the environment at planetary scales, having impacts all over the place. On the other hand, we're having all these consequences, many irreversible, because you know, we, don't, we haven't tried to manage these impacts in a way that respects the needs of the natural world. And so the statement says that our activism will reflect the fact that wealth and wonders of Earth are the common heritage of all that there's our just and equitable access to its resources. And we have to think about future inhabitants, like future generations, and take those account in decision-making. And therefore we have to use more wisdom and judgment 
coming with our global maturity, but it's certainly not the case the way nations are, are behaving at the present time, but much more like adolescents fighting with each other. And of course, they then talk about the, the grave effects of surpassing planetary limits from climate change, biodiversity, and environmental aggression and pollution. We have to be more collaborative and constructive between the people in the natural environment. It also talks of communicating on multiple levels. And this is another thing that we're developing in the accounting project. We're looking at accounts for the individuals, you know, for communities, you know, for institutions, the government, and at the global level. And so they point out that all the Earth's inhabitants should be living in harmony with the natural world. But therefore, they, people have to be able to participate in this constructive process that gives rise to it, not just being manipulated by outside interests. We have to build our capacity as individuals, communities, and institutions, which is, again, what we're trying to do with the accounting project. For the individual, and many of those capacities that you need to be able to contribute scientifically, technically, in social, moral, and spiritual ways, understanding the concepts, knowing the facts, a whole set of kinds of knowledge that each individual on the planet needs to be able to take on you know, this, this role of responsibility. For local communities, which Gary talked about again, you know, we have to build the capacity to shape the cultures in the communities to be more respectful you know, of, of the world and of each other. We need to create a, individuals blended together in a collective effort, you know, focusing on the higher dimensions of the human spirit. So that's really what we can do at the community level. Every community has the capacity already to do that first step in the process. Then they say we have to pay attention to the organizations and institutions. They also need the capacity to act on these issues and to be of service to the common good. Instead of too often, national sovereignty means defending selfish interests against trying to be the most powerful, the biggest, the best, as opposed to being service to the common good. So changing the mentality, even in our institutional structures. It's like the mandate of the state should be long-term in nature, not looking at the short-term as at present, but governing you know, the, 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 everything within the country for generations to come, and also respecting the commons, whether they be the commons within the country, the common things like the atmosphere is a commons, nobody owns any part of it, you know, many of the things, but also the public goods you know, at the planetary level, which of course, things like a proper climate. So the, the, you know, the, the statement calls for respecting these as well as the responsibility of governments. They also say we should take care of the disadvantage, bringing them into more harmonious relationships, paying attention to the contributions of indigenous peoples who can have long experience in living in harmony with nature and that we can learn from that better models for present and future generations. Then of course, because we're trying to replace GDP with this new accounting system, there's several references to this in the BIC statement. Well, they talk about budget centered around well being or indicators of progress more holistic than gross domestic product must be expanded and deepened. And fundamental questions are what are the qualities which a person, a nation, a corporation are judged successful? For what are they commended or appreciated? So, our, our, our aim for these indicators is that these are the qualities that we should be developing to really show what well being is, what respecting the environment is. We're trying to give you know, concrete representation to what the statement is calling for. The call for a more holistic conception of progress, getting away from this materialistic mindset that views the individual as a purely self-centered economic unit, competing with others, giving ever greater share of the world's material resources. While we, you know, science has shown that these are false assumptions, they're still built into many of the structures of our society. The assumptions are still there. And therefore, we need basic notions of progress, development, and prosperity to be recast in a far a more holistic framework of exactly what the accounting project is trying to attempt. And then they call for measures of progress. You know, well, sustainable development goal calls also for measures to complement gross domestic job at GDP. And that they suggest that maybe each part of the UN system could in their own thematic area develop part of this. And again, the accounting project recognizes how FAO could do the food accounts, FAO could do the health accounts and so on. Few parts of the UN system have a lot of capacity already to take this kind of new accounting forward. And of course, then they say we have to be much more holistic. All of this is related together. They can't be dealt with separately in different silos. So it's not a single set of findings, an ongoing process of inquiry into what sustainable situation includes. And this is, again, you know, where we're trying to, to develop an, an ongoing evolving process that may be involved in rethinking how we measure where we're going forward to meet the needs that are identified in this BIC statement.
There's only one specific reference to an accounting domain, and of course, to carbon emissions, which are referred to in paragraph 13 of the statement that we need to look much better at how we're dealing with, with the, the carbon cycle. And then I mentioned the major focus is on spiritual capital, understanding human nature and the qualities and attitudes of trustworthiness, mutual support, commitment to truth, a sense of responsibility. This is how we can build a stable social order, which is far from the case in many countries today. It would give my, the, the models that would get away from materialism and ensure that we see prosperity as with many other facets of individual collective well-being than just financial well-being, material well-being. And they talk about the importance of social and moral laws, that greed is inherently corrosive of the common good, and that we need to be measuring acts of selfless compassion, which is part of, of spiritual capital, working for others rather than thinking only of oneself. And therefore, the path to more harmonious relationship with nature can't be just technological adjustment. It must involve communities, societies, learning to align themselves with higher principles. And of course, religion is part of that process. And they refer specifically to religion providing a bubble against ideologies of materialism. And how, if we look at what religion is doing in many places in the world, how can it build cohesive communities working to manifest these high ideals in practice? So then, you know, they really call, call for looking at the example that Baha'is and others are setting to try to use this as a way of making the transformation needed in society. And therefore, putting the, the transcendent elements of the human spirit in connection with the divine and you know, combining spiritual principles you know, as a way you know, of selflessness, solidarity with others to present the natural world to advance broad-based social progress. And then the statement concludes oh, very quickly here with a, a vision of the future, which is very encouraging at a time when everybody is so negative. So we're looking at civilization in harmony with the natural environment, with a redefined sense of progress, the community individuals working together with their institutions, realizing their highest aspirations, <clears throat> relieved of the destructive moral compromises, social, economic, and environmental that have been asserted as necessary to progress. And this movement toward this vision has begun, and these lofty ambitions are being articulated, and action is being called for on scales unseen. But of course, as Gary also pointed out, it is governing intention and action. Governments promise lots of things, and then they don't necessarily deliver. But they, the statement says we can bridge this gap. If individual communities contribute their share of those goals every day, and, but that means we also need stronger consensus and collective will among nations in order to put these values in, you know, into the stage for human development. So this is really the statement is calling for us all together, and that's why it's a statement too the UN to the world as a whole, to get a stronger collective will to address the challenges we're facing and to try to turn the world around before that it's too late. And we have to put these values into practice, committing ourselves to what's beneficial for the common good, discarding whatever stands in the way of answering the moral and practical of the present hour. This is a high endeavor indeed, and it benefits with a priceless legacy that must be left to generations to come. So let's all join together in rising to its demands. And you can do that directly to work on the statement and also by supporting what we're trying to do with the global systems accounting framework. So thank you very much for listening to my brief summary of how these two relate to each other. Thank you very much, Arthur. And I would like to give a minute to Christine because uh, I'd probably uh, also introduce a new concept of solidarity uh, into the naming part of the uh, global system accounting. So Christine. And what I have noticed in the past half year being really very much involved in this process is that we now have a fantastic conceptual framework. We have a, a wealth of information and all the working groups have explored the different areas. We have um, <clears throat> many aspects identified that need to be considered. Um, I also noticed that we are just trying to continue to do the same thing. Of course, we need to build that foundation and that can go on forever. This is a good thing. And our meeting today helps us in that endeavor to educate ourselves, to, to make our foundation stronger. But what I th think what we need to do is to really try to find a way to make this concrete. Can we really find a concrete indicator to measure, like to, to really account for any of these areas 
and be specific to, to really come up with an accounting system. Um, so maybe when we have the, the working groups, um, we could just try to find um, just in one area, maybe think of the national level or whatever, try to think of something concrete. How can we really make this project a reality? You know, uh, because it's so beautiful and wonderful. So we should really try to now come to stage two of the project and find concrete ideas. Uh, so th that's just a suggestion for the working groups and for the work ahead that while still building on our foundation and educating ourselves, this is all great. We do need to now explore the actions, you know, like what can be done. Maybe we discover it's not possible and that's okay too, but we do need to make that step.